beaches on Long Island are everywhere. <laughs> you can't really be more than 20 minutes away from a beach. My husband and I do like uh, walking on the beach. We like walking in general. We take a point of walking every day, you know, just to be able to talk about the day's events, but also you know, it's part of staying healthy. And I think that's one of the really nice things about Long Island is uh, it's being close to the water. It's pretty you know, a calming influence. Walking and nature are things that are meaningful to me. But if I have a choice of doing a lot of things, I think being outside and being part of nature is something that, that is meaningful. It's really a way of freeing your mind because then you have a, a, a direction to go. It gives us the opportunity to reflect on what we've done, to reflect on what we're doing next, but also to reflect on the bigger picture of how the work we're doing fits into the broader ecosystem. My parents were born in Latvia, which is a small country in Northeast Europe. And they were married in 1938, um, you know, full of hope and uh, everything else. But very soon the Second World War broke out and Latvia was uh, basically overrun and my parents became uh, political refugees. So where they ended up after the war, they had to leave Latvia, was in Germany. So my parents were there for five years uh, after the war. Eventually, they got visas to come to the United States. They were sponsored by a Lutheran church in Kansas City, Missouri. And that's where I was born. Eventually, it was in Kansas City, Missouri. And my father worked there at a variety of jobs for several years until eventually they moved to Akron, Ohio, where he had the opportunity to actually work as an electrical engineer, which was what his training was. Synthetic rubber, one of wartime's newest industries, one of America's modern miracles. Akron at that time was absolutely the rubber capital of the world. All of the major tire companies were located there not only their headquarters, but they had manufacturing there. And there were certain days where you would come out and you could smell, you know, the, the factories, and occasionally there would be fly ash, you know, there would be debris, you know, on our cars in the morning. Um, it wasn't every day, and I'm certain things have cleaned up, but yeah, we were certainly aware that we were in a manufacturing town. My father worked for Goodyear Aerospace, so he wasn't really involved in tire manufacturing, but Goodyear was such a dominant player uh, back in those days. Akron was a great place to grow up. My parents uh, specifically chose a house that was only two blocks away from the grade school, so I could walk to school. My junior high, I could also walk to. It's a little bit further, it's about a mile and a half away. And I think in many ways, it was a very kind of traditional uh, upbringing. One of my distinct memories, however, is going to kindergarten. Um, at home, we always spoke Latvian, so I never learned English until I went to school. So it was a bit of a surprise when I went to kindergarten and realized that I couldn't understand anything. And my brother, who was three and a half years older than me, I think, if I remember right, he would stop by class every once in a while just to kind of help translate, I think, because he had been at school. He spoke a little bit more English than I did. I attended a, a small high school in Bath, Ohio. Uh, it's called Old Trail School, and that was a special environment as well, too. The high school was an all-girls school. I was very interested in science and math. And we had uh, really uh, excellent teachers in science and math who began to teach us uh, calculus and other advanced math, uh, even at a high school level. And in my senior year, the one thing my high school didn't teach was physics. So I actually signed up for a physics class at Akron U. So it was nice to have the opportunity my father said that circumstances in life can change. 
as they had witnessed in their own lives, um, where they basically lost everything. But he said, if you have an education, that's something that nobody can ever take away from you. That's something you have forever. My choice of a, a university was uh, an interesting one. I decided that I wanted to attend the University of Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I pursued a double major in chemistry and also um, history. So this isn't just a major and a minor, but I actually have essentially two bachelor's degrees. After I graduated, I decided that really pursuing a technical path was the best path for me. It was something where I believed that I had abilities that I could pursue and really focus on something. And so then went to Ohio State uh, to pursue a degree in chemistry. At that time, it was a requirement of a PhD in chemistry that you had to have reading knowledge of a foreign language. So I opted for German because I had studied a little bit of German uh, previously. And I knew that as a chemist, many of the original texts would be valuable to read in their in original language. And that's actually where, where I first got to know uh, Ken and my husband is we would, he was also enrolled in these German classes. So the German classes were all the way across campus. So we started, you know, walking back and forth and just kind of talking about these German classes. He has been my partner, not only in life, but in my career, uh, every step of the way. I really believe that the two of us accomplished things as partners that either one of us uh, certainly could not have done on their own. I know I could not have by any chance done what I did without Kenneth's guidance at my side. Esther, she's like water. She is very agile, she is very nimble, she can go in new directions, she can think about new things and she can explore new possibilities, which is really special. What's great about Ken is uh, Ken's like a rock because Ken has remarkable uh, personal strength and also the ability to see and think about new possibilities, possibilities in people, and then um, help them to manifest and become real. Fire is, is me, because I'm, I'm the most impetuous of the group, so. <laughs> so um, it's just a blessing to be able to work as part of this group. Amy Marshlock was a PhD student with my husband, uh, Ken Takeuchi. Amy just has unbounded energy, enthusiasm, um, motivation. Um, she's, you know, a great scientist, a great leader, a great with students, and uh, has just been invaluable. One of the paths to success is surround yourself by great people, people who know what they're doing, who are encouraging and always are, you know, willing to do their share and more. And that's really uh, Ken and Amy. And I'm absolutely convinced that without the two of them uh, at the university, we, we couldn't have accomplished what we've accomplished. So I started my employment at uh, Wilson Great Patch Limited in 1984. And it was a very exciting time to be involved in medical devices. In many ways, um, there were so many devices that were being invented there. It was kind of the explosion of, of uh, invention regarding medical devices. And the, the battery where I ended up being involved um, specifically was for the implantable cardiac defibrillator. But at Great Batch, we took on the challenge to say, we need to have batteries that can last five years or more. So that was really the first project that I was, um, that I was assigned when I first joined the company. And the challenge was enormous. Um, it's the five-year lifetime with no rechargeability. It has to be small enough to fit in a medical device. And while a pacemaker delivers a very small current, a defibrillator has to deliver an exceptionally large current 
to interrupt all the random electrical signals. So we had to go for different technologies, and that was really what we did, is we identified um, lithium as a negative electrode to provide high voltage for the batteries so the devices could function on a single battery if they needed to. Um, materials at the cathode that could deliver very high power had had both silver and vanadium cations, so silver vanadium oxide, they were called SVO. So the vanadium helped facilitate ion transport, um, the silver facilitated electron transport. So we had a very high power system and that was suitable then to actually power a defibrillator. Um, part of the challenge then was building a very high power battery um, keeping it stable enough to last five years and make sure that it was safe enough uh, to be implantable in a human. If I look at the implantable medical battery that she developed, it enabled a new technology, which has now, you know, transformed the way um, human health is treated. It senses what's happening in real time. It responds on demand and it's a very specific form of therapy and treatment. So you don't get the same type of side effects that you think of when you have drug therapies and other types of therapies. The first human implant of the lithium silver vanadium oxide defibrillator battery took place in Australia. And that's really where it all began. And it was that moment that I realized uh, the full impact of what we were doing. When you realize kind of at an emotional gut level that these batteries are going into people, then you begin to realize what, um, what this really means. It was around 2008 or so that um, my doctor told me that I had to put a device in because of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I did not want to do that because I felt it was gonna affect my quality of life. And um, he told me that if I wanted to continue to run after my kids or to run to catch a bus, I should reconsider my decision. Maggie Sullivan, I think in many ways, is just a remarkable person. She's, you know, so dynamic, so energetic, but she does have an entire family history of very serious heart disease. I'm one of five siblings. Two of us have the disease and have devices put in and then my son does, and then among my first cousins, we have 21 first cousins, probably another three or four have devices. Well, it's changed my life because I don't have to worry. Um, so I think that's one of the big things is that if I do run, I don't have to worry. And um, so I feel like much freer, I think, to do the things that I wanna do. I'm active, I bike, I swim, and so I'm comfortable doing the things that I need to do. And at the end of the day, I think, the de having the device is a sense of security, but it's not something that impedes your ability to live a full life. It's really great to know that you can make a positive impact on society and make the world a better place. And I think that kind of wraps back you know, to the original motivation by knowing your skill sets, focusing on those, you know, working hard to hone those skill sets and then taking advantage of an opportunity, uh, you can make a difference, and a difference in a, in a positive way. I really believe that the science we're doing can make a difference, that make a positive difference to society and humanity. Now we're looking at um, energy devices for everything from grid storage, backup power for houses, batteries for electric vehicles. So again, I think it's pursuing answers to questions, but not just esoteric questions and not just questions that are interesting, although I find every question interesting. Um, trying to do things that in the end can have a positive impact on the society and the world. I think that science can help lead us to the type of world that we want to live in. You know, we can solve problems, we can improve medicine, uh, medical devices. 
and um, knowing that there's the next generation of student who cares about these things and are educated to take on these challenges um, is, is really a motivation. They know that it takes effort and they're not afraid of that effort. And it's gratifying to see it. They are positioned to make the world a better place and I believe that will.